Welcome everyone. What a pleasure it is to be here today in sunny Queensland actually on the eve of the Bledslow Cup here in Queensland. Very exciting. I would first like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and their custodianship of the land on which we meet today. I pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. My name is Sarah Kelly and I'm a professor at UQ's Business School. I'm thrilled to be your host today. Personally, I have a passion for sport and in particular rugby. And also um, I'm an expert in sport, in sports integrity, governance and sports marketing. Today, we'll explore the very grand topic, the big challenge, the future of rugby. Rugby union, like most sports, have been revealed as very vulnerable during the COVID-19 pandemic this year. So where is rugby headed and how are we going to future-proof this vital game for world sport? We'll be joined by some experts in the field, and I'm very excited to be with you all today, uh, who will shed light on how we can emerge stronger than ever. Today's webcast is being recorded and in the unlikely event that some slight technical issues may arise, the event recording will be circulated via email tomorrow. So just before we do get started, I'd like to point out the interactive features of the webcast player you are watching right now. So just below me, uh, next to your timeline, you'll notice a speech bubble. And so that's the comment box. So please feel free to use this. And if you'd like to pose a question or a comment at any time during the web webcast, you just click on that speech bubble uh, and complete the form. So, so to share some insights into the future of rugby in Australia and around the globe, I would really like to welcome, and it is my pleasure to do so today, three special guests who are also proudly UQ alumni. Firstly, I'd like to welcome Stephen Moore, and I know these people really don't need any introduction to our audience, but um, I will give them um, credit for their amazing CVs here. He is a former Wallabies captain and remains the only Australian hooker to have played 100 tests, finishing his career with 129 national cup caps. In 2019, he was made a member of the Order of Australia in the Queen's Birthday Honours in recognition of his service to rugby union and charitable organisations. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you. Next, we have Pat Howard. Pat is a former Executive General Manager of Cricket Australia and has since been involved as a consultant in the Wallabies High Performance Review of the 2019 Rugby World Cup campaign with Nathan Sharp, otherwise known as Sharpie, Sharp. I think. Pat sits on the board of Queensland Rugby Union and was formerly the general manager of the Australian Rugby Union. Welcome, Pat. And last but not least, we have Kate Killer-Turner, as she is known in rugby circles. And Kate, we want to get to the bottom of those stories soon. Kate is currently the head coach of the University of Queensland Rugby Club Women's Premier Rugby Programme. She played lock for UQ from 1998 to 2003 and represented Queensland in the 15-a-side game. So welcome again, everyone, and thank you for being here today. So I thought we'd kick off with a fairly broad question, which I'd like to, I think, first direct to Pat, if that's OK. Where, Pat, is rugby headed? Uh, what is the strategy, as you see it, to future-proof the game of rugby? I think, um, Sarah, thanks, and really lovely to be here with really some good thinking minds and to those in New York, um, love to be there, um, sort of, uh, obviously <laughs> late night. Um, but uh, look, I think the game depends on how you want to cut it. Australia is a really interesting microcosm because we've got lots of different football codes and Australia's a really unique place where international sports like the basketballs and the soccers and the rugbies can't always get ahead of some of the domestic leagues, which mm -hmm. are, have got a really strong presence and really cater to the palette of an Australian and, and it really customises well. But when you go to the World Cup and nearly 100,000 Australians went to the Rugby World Cup in Japan last year and 
Um, the game is incredibly healthy when you think about that. There's USA League starting up. You've got sevens that are played in some of the most unique places around the world. I think in the most recent studies, the sixth fastest growing game in the world. So there, there are lots of different ways to cut and slice and dice. So you can, I'm an incredible optimist. I'm incredibly positive about the game. But there's also ways that it needs to be different and challenge and continue to modernise to, to work in different countries and different places. Um, you know, the Six Nations is an incredibly positive tool and, and often you'll get England playing Scotland, packed out 80,000 stadium at Twickenham, and on the same day, and I know this has happened a couple of times, the Wellington Sevens will have a packed out stadium with an England Sevens team. England's playing Still Scotland there. Sevens yeah. team. So you can actually have multiple teams playing at multiple times. And it's a really unique proposition, which lots of domestic sports couldn't even fathom. I know when they talk about, uh, in my days in cricket, where they said, it's amazing you have three different versions of the game. It's, that's it. That's awesome. It is. Um, and I think rugby has particularly two very strong commercial products. Mm -hmm. And I also think two community products. Mm -hmm. Sevens is a great entry um, to the game. I, I know in the cricket days you talked about, for those that love cricket, um, you know, watch test cricket. For those that don't love cricket, mm. what play, watch and play T20. Mm. Rugby has this same vehicle. You know, if you love the game and you're an aficionado, which if you're at that dinner, you are, um, you love test rugby, you love the battle. Yeah. You love the, you love the debate. Was the scrum strong enough? Was the line-out strong enough? Mm. How does a Steve Moore and Kate and myself, all playing three very different positions, three, three very different body shapes, have equally important roles in the field? I love mm. that about the game incredibly important. So I, I think it's got some unique um, uh, competitive advantages. Mm. I think it's some, has some unique challenges. Um, but in the same thing, you've got to modernise with what is the global game. And um, mm. uh, I think they've got to embrace the passion that works in some countries um, and find the competitive advantage to compete in an Australia or an Ireland or some of those other countries where you're trying to grow the game. Mm. No, really good points and totally agree with you. We've got some really, fan in terms of a business model, uh, great assets in the portfolio, you would say, that are sustainable competitive advantages, you say, Pat. Um, Stephen, can you add to that from your perspective? Yeah, look, I think some of the challenges of the game are around where the traditional revenue levers have existed mm. now, may not always be there. I think sports broadcasting is being disrupted. Mm. You're seeing the likes of... You know, the Amazons, I know even at the moment we're having a discussion around Rugby Australia uh, being brought, you know, rugby being broadcast on Stan, for example. Mm. So that traditional model around sports broadcasting and the revenue that, that generates is is being disrupted a little bit. And I think the other part we've seen is that just how reliant some of the home nations are on ticket revenue. So the Irish... Rugby Union have only today been bailed out by the Irish government for about 13.5 million euros. So they're used to having full stadiums. They're very reliant on gate revenue and merchandise and all the things that go with that. And I think you see how quickly, if that's taken away, how quickly things fall over. So uh, we can never be complacent about that stuff, even though some of those unions, when they do go well, are, are highly profitable and generate a lot of revenue. So... Um, you know, Australia's in an interesting position there. We we don't have some of those things. We don't necessarily have big gate revenue, big merchandise sales compared to some of our competitors. So we need to think a little bit differently about how we go about it. And that's a real challenge because we're operating in a global market. So our players are, are on the global market, you know, and there's there's a lot of clubs and teams around there that can pay a lot more than probably what we can pay. So our value proposition has to be slightly different. And... I think we're at a crucial time in, in our game's history in Australia around what the next 10 to 20 years look like. I think the, the grassroots, you know, the backbone of the game is, is in, a, a, in a reasonable spot. You know, I think we're, we're seeing that coming through in club rugby. You know, university is a great example of that. Uh, but that, that professional game is in a really interesting place. You know, as we stand today, we don't know what the competition looks like next year. And that's... That's pretty unique, you know. If you compare us to, say, the NRL or the AFL, always you know have maximum clarity about what their competition looks like year on year. So, I guess the other thing that's being spoken about is private equity, and and that exists already in the UK. So Six Nations, uh, and also the Premiership in the UK have a, a big private equity ownership structure. So 
you know, that comes with it, the trimmings of private equity ownership. So I know that New Zealand are talking to private equity, Australia is being mentioned as well. So Mm. that may be something that comes into the game here and that's going to be really interesting. That They bring with them a lot of capital to do things, but, um, you know, they also want control and decision-making. So we've got to be ready for that. That's right. And that's a really good point, Stephen. You know, does the ownership structures of the business model of rugby, do they need to change? And it sounds like perhaps that would be a good idea because it may make the game a little bit more resilient uh, where we've seen it really quite vulnerable this year. Mm. And Kate, I wouldn't mind asking you just on the the vulnerability we've seen uh, around the, the game of rugby and all professional sports globally this year. What are your views on the way forward for rugby as the game to build a more resilient resilient game and probably a more innovative one? And I know you speak from a perspective of diversity and inclusion, which mm. Pat discussed. Yeah. Look, I think um, from, from my perspective, I think rugby really needs to, you know, I'm I'm very passionate about the grassroots level. That's where yeah. that's where where uh, where my experience is, and and certainly I think we we need to get more people playing rugby. And as Pat said, mm. the the game is beautifully suited to a wide variety of body shapes and capabilities, and um and people from all across all across um, all across different walks of life. And and certainly I think um, that's going to be really really important for us, mm. particularly with the competition with um, with other other winter sports, but we're playing rugby all year round now. So I think also um, the other thing from a from a, a future proofing perspective is, I think we need to make rugby more accessible to everyone. And mm. and I, look, I I love that I, I'm a Fox Sports user. I love that Fox Sports have supported rugby for for an extended period of time. But I think also the lack of availability of some of those rugby games to the general public has been something that has continued to perpetuate the this, I suppose the more um, high end of town elite sort of culture yeah. within rugby, and so I'm not negotiating any TV do- deals, thankfully. Uh, but but I certainly believe that from a from a, a grassroots getting down to to the Australian public who love sport, mm. we really need to reconnect with that and um, and think about some of the some of the aspects that make some of our domestic sports really competitive in the local mm. market and how we can learn from those. So so that's sort of where I sit from 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 that perspective. And that that does make sense, doesn't it? If you can develop the game and getting more people watching and playing the game more frequently, then that that is the business model of professional sport, really. So it's a really good point you make, Kate. And I think while we're speaking to you too, you know, we all remember the the fantastic um, gold medal winning performance by our Rugby Seven women's team during the Rio Olympics. And so can you tell us how we can perhaps build on that particular product in the portfolio of rugby, uh, you know, with the rise of women's sport more generally around the world? And you're obviously playing a very important leadership role in this as a coach as a former player. So what are your perspectives on the women's game and Rugby Sevens? So I'd, Rugby Sevens, the, the gold medal win in Rio was so fantastic. It was so exciting and um, and some of those athletes, those women are amazing. And um, mm. and I think the, the growth of, of women's sevens has been really helpful for the game because uh, it allows an easy transition pathway from a lot of other athletes into, into rugby. So that's been a really successful pathway mm. for us over the years is, um, is, you know, code switches who come from one to another. Um, so that's been really, really good. And I think the other thing is it's a nice, it forms a nice part of the development pathway for, for women and girls into um, not um, really, really, really high level contact with very technical components mm-hmm. of the game. It's a much lighter version in from a from a rules and a and a physicality perspective. So I think as an access point, sevens has been fantastic for women's mm-hmm. rugby, and the number of girls and women playing sevens has the interest has been has been really really good. I think we've probably maybe weren't expecting to be, I don't know if we were quite, certainly in Queensland, quite prepared for the level of interest that mm. came after that after that win. Mm. Um, but certainly it's continuing to grow and a lot of young girls are coming in through that pathway. The other interesting thing about the Sevens uh, portfolio is that um, there, there's sort of a, um, a bit of a gap in Sevens in that there's, a, there's an elite 
very high level elite program and then there's a lot of social sevens programs and and there's a beginning to be a little bit more of a bridge of that gap but there's still not really there's no club based Mm -hmm. sevens competition for women so I think there are still some holes in the women's game Mm -hmm. that being said though uh, women's rugby has made some great moves forward with the super w women's competition and having a national based competition as opposed to Mm. the carnival style which has really changed the way that our players and the aon sevens and super w it's been it's been fantastic and all of the young girls that i coach look to those those um those competitions and and aspire to to play in it and we did an end of season season survey for our cohort this year Mm. um and the i think about three quarters of the players had representational aspirations either in sevens or in fifteens and this is our fifteen oh, isn't that program. Fantastic. So it's, so there is that desire amongst the girls that, that I coach certainly to yeah. to progress and develop and and so I think that that's gonna be crucial. And I think also just as you said that the culture of women's sport with cricket and AFL and it's you terrific. know it's, it's a yeah. great time to be a woman. I'm very jealous of all of these younger girls who are, if only it had been 20 years ago. Um, you've no, had some, something that I find really interesting in women's sport at the elite level is, is just the amount of crossover between athletes playing different sports. Yeah. So uh, Elise That's Perry is a great example yeah. playing cricket for Australia and also soccer. I've seen examples of netball and Soccer, there's, there's AFL, AFL and yeah, AFL and basketball yeah, and talent. A lot of the sevens, yeah, girls, of the sevens girls have been playing in the NRL the last few yes, months. Yes, they have. Yeah, so, yeah. So I think that's a really interesting thing and a great example for young girls to think you don't have to go down a particular path. It's it's no, there's no. many different options and and I think all those sports have come to the fore in the last. Yeah. five to ten years, you know, and I think that's yeah. a great thing. I and agree. It, and I think the openness that, that Maury in regards to, you know, and this is where you, rugby uh, benefits is that there is touch, there is league and there's union, there's a mm. lot of transferable skills yeah. amongst those. Mm. And instead of being closed off and pigeonholed to those operations, you know, I had to sit there for a while in the cricket days and manage Pez's diary between her soccer mm. commitments and her <laughs> cricket commitments. And But what we did come to a realisation with soccer, we, we came to an understanding. We just said, right, international trumps domestic. That was the, the conversation we had. And so that – and we worked with her through that period to try and make that happen. And with a real – and this is where the male mindset traditionally is close yourself off to other sports mm. and we're going to keep you and hoard you yeah. versus how do we work together – to give a great experience um, and, yeah. and, and I, I think better role models. So We're doing that existingly now with between the 7s and the 15s because we're mindful. We don't want to pigeonhole yeah. players for one or the other. We have some players who play um, have played AFL at the same time as playing rugby union. Yeah. And ultimately, from a coaching perspective, all I want to see is the girls having a footy in their hands as much as they can. Mm. So if it means that they're playing league, playing touch, AFL, it doesn't really matter as long as the as long as they've got a ball in their hands. That's right. And they're and they're practicing those basic mm. those basic innate skills. Then we can coach mm. the girls to be able to yeah. do that and to succeed. So I think I think women's rugby is in a in a really awesome space. There are certainly some things that um, there are some gaps in the pathways mm. in relation to that development 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 um, channel um, for both sevens and fifteens. I think there's a a gap in in for the social component for the 15s right. aside. And as you say, Pat, maybe maybe the 15s doesn't, maybe that's not for, maybe it's a 10s and a 7s aspect. Mm. So the more social and keep 15s as the, as the I suppose, the high-level traditionalist yeah. approach. I don't, know, I don't know what the answer is. And, on, and on, I'm very, and this is where you don't take the cookie cutter approach. I yeah. think rugby a little bit in Australia, less so overseas, mm. once has that inferiority complex occasionally go, what, what is league doing? Well, what are New Zealand doing? Mm. Uh, and are we just copying the men's game? And I saw that in, in, in the professionalisation of women's cricket. I saw that a lot. Oh, we'll copy the men's program. And I'm going, hold on, wait a sec. The women are more professional than the men. Let's mm. just let's just let's just try and create something that gives you a great opportunity to perform. And skills can be developed through any of those games. Mm. That's the that, that rule applies for men and women. Yes. Um, you know, you you playing sevens and Carwin Isles, who's this speedster. Who plays for the USA National Sevens? Yes, yes, and I know. just you know an ex hundred meter sprinter, never made the top five or six, so mm. eighth or ninth, let him run around, and it's just a great entry into the game, mm. and it's amazing to see mm. these 
athletes become players. I don't like the term athletes. I, I, I love rugby players <laughs> and, and it's a term that I love using, maybe because, Maura, you and no, I probably no wasn't the best athlete. <laughs> no, no, I was going to say, I, I, I'm, yeah, I'm the it. one who was dreaming of being a fullback, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I think I'm in the same yeah, we, we use the term athlete loosely, you know, so... Well, I guess, I guess building on what we're just discussing now, you know, we've talked a little about, well, a lot about the grassroots, these, these growing products of rugby sevens, the women's game, I think even into the varsity system in the US and Canada, we're seeing growth of the sevens. But let's talk a little bit about innovation in general and how we can bring grassroots rugby, which is a very successful product in this portfolio, and the professional game together more in, in alignment uh, around the game structurally and culturally. And secondly, I think any other innovative revenue streams, what, what can we look at for the future there? This is, this is an interesting one. I'm going to start off if that's okay. Yeah, and sure. and it probably comes back to one of the things... Um, Squeaks, you were talking about in relation to uh, the the TV rights and all those kinds of things, and and my husband is a massive NBA fan, and so we NBA League Pass is one of his go to go to things that he uh, that he he has on his phone, and and I, and some of those new products, I don't think it's also just those single streaming um, streaming models, and you look at tennis who are looking at actually owning their own content and selling it. Yeah. to various providers in a, in a much more tailored way as opposed to I'm going to give all of my rights to a particular broadcaster in this particular network mm -hmm. who then on sells it. And it's not my area of expertise, but it's certainly something from, from my perspective that I look at the products that are out there and think mm -hmm. this is an interesting channel to explore. I don't know whether either of you have had any experience yeah. and discussions around around those types no, of and innovations I, and products. Yeah, I'm really um, – and, and Maury touched on a little bit on – where are the new revenue streams? So I, when I was working at uh, Rugby Australia back in 2007, oh, how are we going to do Should we negotiate with Fox or should mm. we have a look at the others? And, yes, the paywall was significantly more expensive than it is today. And yeah. I probably have, have morphed my view as the price point becomes a lot cheaper in Australia as it is in the US. Mm. Maybe, you know, we all take on Netflix and I know in some of the most recent... Um, so Cricket Australia, some of you in here in this room, maybe in the US saw... Um, the documentary produced by Cricket Australia called The Ash, called The, te um, the oh, Test. Oh, that was brilliant. That was, now, that was very, very well done. Completely made by Cricket Australia, packaged up, put a bow on it, yeah. and went, went to auction and said, so they think Amazon didn't make it. Amazon had nothing to do with the production of it. Mm. And, it and you saw it with The Last Dance and, and to, in terms of the basketball production. ESPN, there. that was, yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah. You, you're seeing um, sport take the video behind the wall give you new assets in behind the game. Uh, and this is the sort of thing, you know, imagine if rugby had um, put, a, put a TV screen in behind the boardroom when, um, you know, they're dealing with <laughs> the Raylene Castles and, uh, you know, this is content that you would never, ever see. Mm -hmm. And so there is stuff that is really interesting to people and I think um, that there is... Um, the, the traditional Stein, Sevens, Tens need professional. They need sport mm. and that will drive, um, unfortunately, there'll be gambling revenue and all those sorts of things in behind it, a little bit less to advertising. So the model is changing. Mm. But the number of players are increasing. Mm. The Amazons, um, the Netflix, the Stands, they all went in for the IPL rights only recently. They did Star. I yeah, Star know. went in heavily. Facebook. So, Facebook was in. Yeah, Facebook was in as well. So... Um, we just got to adapt to the new models, mm. and you'd adapt. The content's just not about in, in rugby's terms the eighty minutes. Mm. You know, it, it's, it's the stories behind. Absolutely, this, AFL's been brilliant about telling stories. You know, mm. uh, is mm. AFL women's program eight weeks a year? Yeah, that's right. Right now, that's a two-month program. Mm. Women's sevens is a whole year program. Goes all around the world. It's actually a far. There are far more stories, it's great far story. more equality in that regard to the length of the season, mm. but we don't tell the story well. No, um, and a lot of people don't don't understand that and are unable to yeah. connect with it. So I'm incredibly positive about the model change. Um, I think Maury's right. You've got to adapt to it. But do I think the players are changing? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think um, there is a market there if you want to produce content that is in, enticing. So that, that's that side of the model. And then you look at the other ways to reduce costs. Yes, private capital. It's universities, AI and Sevens. Mm. How do you reduce your costs? Mm. We're all we're university people and you know, there's this, you know, if I'm talking to my daughter, you know, do you wanna if you wanna play sevens, there are scholarships to universities all over the there world. Are. It's amazing. Mm. 
Mm. And it is just, you know, so the opportunities of a global game um, are incredibly enticing to any gender. Yes. And I, I'm, I remain incredibly positive about that. So on this innovation aspect to the game, which is I think is absolutely fascinating because even in business we're all dealing with this massive disruption even prior to the pandemic around digital disruption, for instance, and now we've got crisis disruption. So, Stephen, would you have any further thoughts about how rugby can innovate? I know off the back of what Pat was just saying about that really fascinating potential growth revenue in sport more broadly around uh, the content and the storytelling, uh, perhaps there's opportunity there for new sponsors and new sponsorship markets, for instance, but I'm keen to hear your thoughts. Mm. Yeah, look, sponsorship's certainly a challenge and we've seen that in rugby in Australia this year. The other thing I'd emphasise is the game day experience and I think whilst that's not anywhere near the full picture, I think that's something in Australia we, yeah. we can do a lot better. Good point. So people don't go to the game just for the game. You know, they go for an experience. They want to maybe get something to eat, take their children listen to some music, you know, there's a bunch of things you can create around the game day experience that adds value and and compels people to want to be there, you know. So I think that's, mm -hmm. I think the days of going, sitting in your seat, watching the game and going home, that's that's <laughs> over. And you know, we see around the world that the organisations that do that so well. And even in the AFL, you look at Port Adelaide creating that, the <laughs> song beforehand, you know, the Liverpool that's song right. that they sing. The old never tear us apart. Yeah, that's in right. excess, Sorry, the great in song. Excess, but, <laughs> but that's that's adapted from places like Anfield with Liverpool and True. those kind of examples around the world. Which that's why people want to go. They they want to watch the game, but they want to be there for that buzz, that atmosphere. And and we we've got work to do in that area, I think. And then I think to the game itself, the whole concept around wearable technology and data collection on the field being broadcast into living rooms and onto smartphones at the ground. I think that's a really interesting space as well. And we've seen that come a long way already with acceleration and metres run and heart rates and all that sort of stuff. And that's that right. kind of thing is, is interesting to people. You know, yeah. Once again, as, as Pat and Kate mentioned, you're bringing people closer to the game than they ever have been before. And mm -hmm. any opportunity we can do, we have to do that. that that's what creates value. And that's why people want to pay a premium for, for your product. It's true. That's, that's a really good point and we, that we haven't touched on yet, the, the fan engagement and the match day experience and, you know, the sports tech around the world we're now seeing that's becoming a bit of a benchmark, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, things like augmented reality, use of drones, uh, hologram technology as well I'm seeing and hearing. Yeah, so yeah. the idea of a Warnie style thing in rugby, I don't know who who comes to mind. Maybe it's someone Maury. like Kate or <laughs> Maury as a hologrammed uh, spiritual leader of the game being mm. beamed into stadia. But it, you know, it's, it's really exciting and it's an exciting mm. opportunity for rugby. Mm. So I think um, moving on, what do you think is the unique challenges of the game of rugby going forward? What are they and I how think, can we fix them? I think for us at the grassroots, it's around how we improve, um, how we measure safety and things like that. So mm -hmm. rightly or wrongly, there's a perception out there that rugby is dangerous or more dangerous than other sports. And, you know, I don't have the data, but it doesn't feel like that that's actually correct. But if, if there is a perception, then there's a reality. So we need to keep doing more around concussion and neck injuries. And rugby is a very physical game. It's a contact mm -hmm. sport, always has been, and I hope always will be. But we need to be realistic about how we manage that, manage the optics around that, get the right messages out there, get the facts out there in front of our stakeholders mm -hmm. so that we're telling the full story. And once again, things like technology um, are mm -hmm. going to help us to do that. You know, I looked at something last week. That's uh, like 3D glasses for concussion assessment. You know, you, you wear it for a minute and it does a whole heap of patterns and exercises and it tells you basically if you can go back on. So the days of, you know, waving a few fingers around and asking you what day it is, that they're gone. And that's a great thing for us it's because we can easy. use evidence and data to, to mm. back up our positions on things. Mm. And it gives the players greater confidence too in relation to whether whether mm. they personally, you know, can, can play on or can't mm. and, and all those kinds of things. That's right. And often um, there is that problem in the decision-making at the time between the sport and the player. The player does yeah. want to go back on, but it's a, obviously a duty of care, safety issue, and it is a serious issue in 
in contact sports, as we know. But perhaps rugby could take the leadership there in investing in that sort of research or becoming, um, you know, being on the front foot there. And I do know there was a system they've introduced into junior rugby, is it, on the colour yeah. system? Yeah, so there is. There's a mm. grading system. But World Rugby actually are considered leaders um, in they the are. data they are yeah. providing. Uh, a lot of that data drove some of the NFL decisions mm. only a year ago because obviously you go through the hyperbole of everyone, everybody some, has a, an injury yeah. and it's a brain injury and mm. a, that's a problem versus some, some balance in the conversation. You know, mm. it's amazing that the concussion story started from a sport that has helmets. Right. And, yeah. um, you know, it was driven out of NFL. Um, mm. And, look, I saw it with the Phil Hughes injury and, and uh, Phil Hughes' death and, and, and through that process. So um, I do think there is an injury story. I know AFL do a very good uh, role in releasing their injury report, so does Cricket mm. Australia. And, look, I, I know a year after having um, some neck injuries last year, most of them from the tackle, not from scrummaging, from the mm. tackle, um, uh, there weren't any this year. Right. So, so, but it, it's a really interesting under, to, to understand, okay, where is the next step? Because we want a game for all shapes and sizes and I think that's incredibly important. That's right. And I cycle most days and that sport is significantly more more dangerous than by the numbers. Some, some True. Numbers. So I think mm. there is that side. I do think there's some uniqueness in um, making sure the game evolves to speed. You know, it mm. ha the, the commercial, I think the rules are fantastic <laughs> For the amateur game. Right. And I was at the East versus Queensland University finals. I saw a couple of them. Mm. They are just wonderful games. They are. Lots Very of fatigue. Enjoyable. Great mm. to watch. Mm. But I think as teams, I don't think the laws have evolved to work in with, um, you know, effectively 22 players, 23 players. Mm. There's not enough fatigue. And as a consequence, right. the size of got, the players have got very big. Mm. Um, in saying that, the best players in the world are still very fast. Right. Uh, Bowden Barrett is the best player in the world and I think he'd be, you know, 85, 90 kilos. He's, mm. They're not – so we get lost in that a little bit. So I think um, managing the competition spectacle, understanding that Europe wants different things to what Australia wants mm. and Australia making sure – Australian rugby particularly stop being worried about a follower. Um, right. You know, I, I did think the rural innovations in super rugby – um, were far more aligned to rugby league changes. Oh, I thought that was average. Yeah. I didn't mm. enjoy Versus, it. Versus, oh, that's interesting. Why don't we talk about that? The mm. rules. Positive. Do we need rule tra changes? Well, in super I, rugby and where do we need the rule changes, if any? My view on it is, I think the rules are fine. We just need to get better at playing the game in Australia. Look at right. Some of the super rugby games in New Zealand were unbelievable games to yeah. watch. Like just phenomenal, and it's the same rules, right? Mm. So. I, I think yeah. we're quick to blame the rules, and, and I think right. it's also how we how we interpret and and play the play the rules. So the rules mm. themselves are very fine and very clear. Yes, but yeah. when you actually watch as a spectator, watch the game of rugby, mm. there the you know there are long breaks between scrums. There are long breaks in in most decisions that are made on the field, mm. Mm. and so. In that, in that way, it's actually not the decisions that are being made, it's the way that they're being made that is impacting on the, on the, on the sort of the player, the, the viewer experience. Right. I think how we manage the TMO process in rugby is, is massively flawed. Um, so why is that, Stephen? I think we're trying to, to give the, the referee on the field the ability to make a decision, but we're also asking someone upstairs to have their view and they're talking to each other. It takes a long time. It feels like none of them are really committed to making a decision whereas if you look at the NRL bunker and that's not perfect by any stretch but it feels like they're under time pressure or they mm. they make a decision quickly <laughs> so and that's, that's then the game starts again mm. so, so the, the, here right. we are sitting around they're talking to each other in the box and like meanwhile people are changing the channel and, right. and that happens all, so, and that's the difference between having a domestic product domestic game where you mm. control the referees yeah no, Those international right. referees who see the see their bosses are based out of Dublin, right? And they don't really have a feel. They've got no idea what an NRL bunker is. No, they don't care no. about rugby league. They no. don't care about what the Australian market is like. Mm -hmm. They care about growing the the bigger game. So you you do have to. Um, the, I agree with Kate. All the rules are in there. Yeah. there's plenty there, and right. you've just got to emphasise the right things. Uh, you could change the sanctions on some things. Some right. things are penalties. They could be free kicks to speed the game up. Very easy. 
mm-hmm. without changing the fundamentals of the game. And mm-hmm. but I, I, I thought it was interesting in the Super Rugby they they went and said, okay, if the game is a, a tie at the end of the game, they went and adopted rugby league's rules. With, mm. And the guys that obviously were involved in that really didn't think deeply enough about it because um, the, the difficulty in rugby is that you're isolated. You don't necessarily all want, all want the ball all the time under right. the current rules. So they mm. kicked and kicked and kicked. Mm. If you did what maybe in cricket they do is they, they have a super over, well, you just play sevens and you have a, the first one to score mm. a try. Mm. Or, you do, or you do what touch does where they drop a player start off, dropping drop a, play. a player every every, yeah. every minute until you end up with mm. and a it creates, score. And that goes to Mark Lone's point about time and space mm. at the start of this conversation. So I think, you know, be brave enough in your own skin to understand this is a really big, large world game and you're not the second brother to anybody else or any mm. other country and have the faith to go, how are we going to be a game for all shapes and sizes? And make it. It's a, and if you go back to that premise, you will have speed. You'll make sure the scrum works, um, and it has worked for a very, very long time. But the more safety we've brought in, the more rules we've brought in, the slower we've done it. I know when Dad was a tight head prop for Australia, the average yeah. scrum set was about forty seconds, and it's and it's nearly a minute longer than that now, mm. due to the processes that have been brought in, mm. not the rules, just yeah, the processes. Process. Can I ask a question though on that, Pat? You're talking about the. The, the governing remotely from the world game and, and the domestic game. And how does how much control? I I don't I don't know. So I'm asking how much control do we have as a domestic market as part of that broader worldwide structure to be able to influence some of this some of these things that we're talking about. So look, it goes back into start in 2015. Steve led Australia to a World Cup final. The next year, Australia won a gold medal at the Olympics we just talked about. That's right. So in 15 and 16, there was a huge opportunity to own your own product domestically. And we, I, I think we missed that chance. And instead of going that way, we went to more and more countries. And more and more countries makes you far more onus back to the global game. Mm. Um, I remember when BBL was created, it, it had a look at Sansa and said, look, we need to own your own product. You need to be able to make sure it works in your own country and own your own rules and uh, make sure it's adapted to this market. So um, in a domestic market, you can, just as they did this year, Mm. I I actually think COVID's done rugby an incredible service, incredible service. Uh, Leveled the playing field on accessibility. Well, you've gone, (laughs) we have to have a domestic product. Yeah. And you have to have one that works within, Mm. you know, maybe Australia and New Zealand, maybe Japan, but Mm. it's got to work closer to here so Mm. that people can watch Queensland play That's or right. the Brumbies play every week. If you yeah. follow Port Adelaide, Adelaide, you know they're playing Saturday every week. That's right. Um, mm. If you're watching the Reds, you want to be able to watch them every week. And, and it increases um, that level of tribalism and, and, and buy-in right. and, and that links mm. in with the stuff you were saying, Stephen, about you know the game day experience and all those kinds of things because mm. we need that, that mm. buy-in and that momentum against in that domestic space. Well, the most passionately clo- uh, followed team in Australia this year came last in the NRL. Mm. That's uh, like right. Tribalism yep. yeah. is well and truly alive. <laughs> yeah. And you think about the Rabbitohs when they got, you know, yeah. removed from the NRL yeah. and they fought yeah. so hard to get back in. You know, they're the, they're the types of things that we need to try mm. and... So I, I love all that and then I still, and this may be my passion of being a third generation wallaby or standing next to Maury, but then I also want to embrace and inspire kids. You, you want to be a wallaby. Yeah. You want to wear your colours. You want to sing the anthem and it's, I, you know, I didn't do it, I did it less than 100 times less than Maury, but um, it, it is this amazing <laughs> thing to be able to stand there and represent your country and do the best for your, your country and um, it can't all be about the commercialism. There is the heart of standing there going, I'm going to do the best I can for my country and that's why you'll never see me bag the game no. even though we want to see it go better. Yeah, no, that's a really good point too that any brand and including the Wallabies and our rugby union team, you know, they they need to have authenticity and a soul and that is something that rugby does have as a unique value proposition, I would say, going forward, that it is one of the the big international games. The AFL doesn't have that. So, you know, that's a huge point of differentiation that you can sell that story to the hearts and minds of the development part of the game. But what about back to this alignment, which I would say um, cricket, NRL, AFL, netball do very, very well, and that is between the grassroots and the professional game. 
uh, how can we um, bring them together a lot better? We've got a burgeoning grassroots following in, in rugby union in Australia. Um, it, and, you know, it, the, the top is a bit problematic, although it seems to be getting sorted. So what, what can we do to bring them together a lot more, a lot closer, as you're saying, for more content, more regular content, more accessibility? Well, I think the, the Wallabies are always going to be at the pinnacle of that. So we know the role that that team has played over, over history. Yep. Um, so that will always continue and it's incumbent on the people at the time to uphold that. The next tier is is where we've got a lot of unknowns at the moment. You know, Pat's just mentioned the, the domestic competition. Is there a professional model that suits that? I think there's questions to be answered there. I'd love to think that there is. Um, I think where where we, in my view, run into a bit of trouble is where uh, that, that schoolboy level play intersects with the professional game and then the club game. So... Mm. For example, even myself, I would have played three or four years of club rugby before I ever played for Queensland. Pat would have been probably even longer. And back then it was it was considered, you, know, you, you played club rugby, then you got picked from your form in club rugby to play for Queensland or to go to the Brumbies. or And then if you played well there, you played for Australia. So it was quite simple really. And now we've, we've bypassed that a little bit. So... And it happens in rugby league too where it kids, does. 15, 16-year-old, yeah. AFL, AFL I'm sure is similar, mm. 15, 16-year-old kids are, are getting given substantial contracts with a view to them, you know, as soon as they finish school, they then go into a full-time program. And I'm not sure if that's serving us that well. well it, it's funny though, my, my seventh game out of Colts was my test match. Yeah. So, it, and when you actually go backwards, it's happened, mind you, I got dropped. Yeah. <laughs> and I played. Would, would that be would that be an exception? You think back then? No. The funny thing is, in the backs, it, so I've done all the. You know, I know these numbers reasonably well, yeah. and um, uh, backs and back rows go through quickly. Yeah. And then they usually get dropped about five times, mm. and then uh, as we as you'll probably see by the time this comes up in the next twenty four hours, um, that's happened again, mm. and to a certain extent, it's part of the journey, um, but. The thing I love, and Kate, I'll just cut you off, so I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, do, right. I'll do a quick story. I'll, you want a connection, mm. and this is the storytelling bit I yeah. think we miss again. So the captain of East that just won the premiership, 35, oh, 35 yeah. is I think he? so, yeah. yeah. Yep. So Ben Moen, ex Wallabies yeah. captain, comes back in and wants to win a title, and this is a connection between the, the plumber and the uh, maybe a, a banker and an architect and a, and a builder mm. and an ex Wallabies captain. And I love those stories. I loved coming back and playing fourth grade when I was 32, 33 and a busted old body. And I, I, I do think those stories are there to connect because there's only three layers. Mm, there's international, right. yeah. there's super, then there's club. And you're not that far away. Olympic. So there's, well, well I, I, see, <laughs> I, I see that can be, there are these, this is the thing that, Cricket always struggles with it. Yeah. Rugby does as well. It's not a linear pathway. No. There are different ways and you can go off and play sevens mm. if you're a, a fast, nippy person. And we've also spoken about the transfer from other sports as that's well. Right. And, and that, mm. and that costs, mm. costs I guess what I'm saying but is... You're right. That's a good... The connection bit. And I do know, you know, many of our friends who are former Wallabies now have kids who are, the apple doesn't fall far generally, who are mm. now up and coming, you know, A graders in the club land. So you're watching those, you know, down at East the other day. I know Brendan Nasser was down there with young mm. Josh, mm. who's now a Queensland Reds player, mm. um, UQ student as well, I might add. But it's, you know, these stories are there and it, it, they're so easy to tell. There's low barriers now with the social media we've talked about, as women's sport has done yeah. so well because they've had to with lean lean pickings there in the resourcing. But it's something rugby, rugby could do very easily is tell those stories in an authentic way. I Stephen, guess what, what saying, I'm saying yeah. is I suppose if you look across the Wallaby back line on the weekend, mm. how much club rugby have they played? You know, and in, or the whole team actually. And that's really fair. That is you absolutely know, that's, fair. That's the bit where I think they've missed that whole part. You know, so they've gone straight into professional programs. You're right. Training every day, mm. you know, twice a day. You know, I, I, I'm not certain that's the best. No, the, the game needs heroes, mate. I agree mm. with that. And they need people that absolutely embrace. Um, they, need, they need that level to go back to club. And there mm. needs to be gaps in the program. 
Mm, and that's it. giving that's away it. content. Mm. That's giving <coughs> away content. Because you, mm. you've got to give away content yeah, here and not it. say, mm. well, we're going to play every single week to be able to go. Um, we want to be able to go back in club. So, look, yeah. that might mean internationals need to be played on a Wednesday. We all know that happens in State of Origin. Yeah. Yeah. To go back and play in your club. So the, yeah. the, mm. I played a Wednesday Bledisloe Cup. We won. <laughs> on the Saturday I played a Uni played East. Yeah. Mm. And... That was four thousand years ago. Yeah, but yeah. It doesn't happen anymore. But Jack Dempsey's a good example too. I mean, yes. he played for yeah. for uh, Gordon on the weekend. They won the Sydney Premiership. Mm. He he's a Wallaby. He's played uh, probably twenty tests. Not in the team at the moment, but goes back there. You know, I'll bet that's probably one of the most best weeks of his life. You know, so it's it's an absolute difficult process. It's not that they don't want to play club rugby. No, there's no windows to do it, and I think right. we need to look at that. That's can, interesting. Can I, so, oh, yes. Sorry, I, I just wanted to go back to something that um, that Steve said about the school, um, the schoolboy connection, because mm. women's rugby is in a really interesting place at the moment. And I went and um, assisted coaching at a um, a skills seven skills clinic for the Catholic schools here in Brisbane oh, a couple okay. of weeks ago, and um, women's girls' private schools are just beginning to play around in the rugby space. And mm. I think that one of the challenges for rugby historically is that the men's private schools, if you want to be selected or, you know, go anywhere in rugby, there's this massive scholarship program that filters everyone through this massive funnel and up into the various different feeder programs. And women's rugby is at a really unique time because I keep asking myself, well, do we want as the women's program to go down that pathway or do we want to actually try and build a club pathway where someone can play for Easts or for Uni or for Gordon or, you know, wherever it is, Eastwood, if they choose to, all the way through the pathway and play club rugby in their schooling years as opposed to going and playing at this private school or that private school and, and all those kinds of things. And and so from my perspective, I actually think that's a really big barrier for rugby in an accessibility perspective. Mm. And there aren't really, when you think about it, outside of the private schools in the main, you know, the main cohorts, metropolitan, metropolitan areas, areas yeah. how many people are actually playing rugby? What does it look like? And, and so I just think that it's probably something that's very, very difficult to change because it is such a, a, a massive, you know, nursery, as they call it, of talent. But certainly from a women's perspective, we have the opportunity to think about it slightly differently and, and, I'm, and I'm just not quite sure whether that's a good way to go. And I, and I agree with that. And very I know good we've got, point. We've got a little bit of time left. But it, it is – but I, I, I absolutely agree and I agree the issues and the problems. But, you know, when, when BBC won the Premiership this year – the engagement aspect, how many people were sitting outside on Miskin Street. For those of you from Brisbane, that's a street just outside. One of the school that won the first yeah. time in 50 years and I'm not from BBC. No, my uh, players were sitting there before <laughs> before they had to go and warm up watching it on their phones. And so, and so you, you're sitting there going, this is a problem but it's such a great asset. I know. And you're sitting there going, it's the yin and yang of it, isn't it? You know, where these... You know, you're, you know, we all know what's, we watch our, know where our schools have gone. It does engage people. Um, even without the elite stuff, I think it's the pinnacle of a lot of people's time in the game. Mm. You know, they'll play a first 15 game for what, whoever, and it's really special to them. And I know it's a really nerve-wracking exercise and I don't want to waste it, but I agree with you. Once again, we said to talk about this earlier, don't just copy the men's way. Mm. Don't just copy the men's way. There are different ways to do this. And I mm. think, Kate, you, you make a excellent point to just stop before, you, you know, to before yeah. you go down copying a program which may not be the best suit. I agree with you there. Mm. What about, so going back to the point about the media coverage playing a really significant point, you know, you can't be what you can't see, you can't um, follow something that isn't on regularly and is not engaging. And I'm not saying rugby is not engaging, it definitely is. But what can be done there around, you know, we're in the time economy, attention economy. Uh, the other sports we've seen here in Australia have, like the Big Bash you've mentioned, Pat, um, the AFL has invented, reinvented a short, sharp little pre-game as well, AFL X. So can rugby play in that space? Esports, we're seeing diversification into esports and the fantasy sports gathering momentum as another revenue source. What are your thoughts around this in building this media um, platform for rugby? 
getting it out there. Yeah, yeah, Rory. I know I'm not too much about this, but keep going. Oh, a, <laughs> look, I'm gonna, yeah, Pat, I'm gonna... Pat would know a lot more than I would, but I guess Sevens has been a vehicle for that in, mm. in rugby globally. And you know, I think it's been really successful. Like the Sevens series globally has been a, had a lot of impact. And, you know, to, to the game day experience, I think they get that right in certain places around the world. You know, that, that part is mm. people go there for the event. You know, the, the rugby just happens to be on. <laughs> so I know there's a few places in particular that where that's uh, definitely the case, mm. but yeah, look, I think technology and and all those sort of stuff is is at our disposal. It's we are a bit capital constrained in rugby in Australia at the moment. You know, maybe there might be some some more capital on the way, but we can't do everything the AFL do, for example, the NRL. So we've got to be really creative with exactly and really resourceful yeah. with how we do it and. To, to give credit to the, the people in there, I think you know, rugby.com, their little team, they generate a lot of content with a very small team. I think there's only one or two of them cranking out as much content as they can. So they're doing a lot with, with not as much resources as... I know the Broncos, for example, have double the size of digital team as yeah. Rugby Australia. You know, so. See, that's good, isn't it? So they're doing, they're looking at that. So do you think it, that one solution could be Rugby TV, some sort of YouTube, their own channel? And, and look, I think... Free-to-air channel? And, and there is. Mm. So rugby dump. And look, if you walk into my house, and this is where I, I mm. sit there with massive... I left two blokes tackling each other at 6 o'clock this morning. Um, <laughs> so Sounds like yeah, our house. <laughs> yeah, the, the top 20 steppers comes up on YouTube as the first thing they've watched and there is rugby dump and rugby GG. And, and so there's a lot of mm. free content out there. And remember, yeah. people under... That's what they watch. They watch it that way. They search it that way. Now That's we right. have to make sure they are searching rugby, and you you hold on to the heartlands, mm. and this is where you know their school influence is so important. You know, um, you know, I've got one kid that will search mountain biking, and one kid that will search uh, rugby, and another one that will have a look at something else. And so I think um, the AFL have a huge media division. Cricket Australia has a huge division. My my budget at Cricket Australia was bigger than the, all of rugby's revenue. So you, you, you've got to understand where Steve was, was how do, how do we act, um, how do you get bang for your buck? Mm. How do you leverage all these other um, free content that is out there yeah. to you know, drive that um, in, into the markets that are passionate? Mm. Um, and, and so I think... Um, you know, Rugby 365, EA Sports, out of the 2019 World Cup went bananas through Europe and South Africa after they won and England went to the final. Mm. Uh, their heroes came out of it, the first of a black captain leads South Africa. Um, that generated significant sales through that period. So Australia's a 20 million population, 25 yeah. million population. And, you know, the lessons I learned from cricket, once again, is that just because we don't like something, um, another country might really like it. India dwarfs Australia. I was reminded that many, many times. <laughs> it's the <a> pilot market. <laughs> exactly. That's right. So, you know, I think, um, yeah. you know, I look at the US and how exciting the game is over there. Um, I look at uh, Europe and where it can be second. Um, and there is a lot of content out there. It's competing with a lot of eyeballs mm. and a lot of spaces. And I don't deny that. But um, I'm not sure going hiring and, and, and have really big production teams in-house like other sports have done is the best. And I agree with Maury. I think they're doing mm. the best they can with what they have. Oh, it sounds like they are. You know, and I've seen yeah. some of that content and it's, it's excellent. It's yeah. great. Like the, yeah. the the club games were broadcast Yeah, I was going to say week. exactly the same yeah. thing. It was fantastic to be able yeah, to live great. stream on them. On YouTube yeah. and commentary. And mm. this is all done on a pretty small budget, I imagine. And mm. I saw them Very on small. Sunday up the back there. Just, and the reach is still strong They're all just got a online. microphone and yeah. I think that, new cameras running around the field. You know, it's, that was, that was an cool. awesome innovation this year. Yeah. And I, I watched, I've got small kids at home, so I couldn't watch the women's mm. premier final this year. So I had it at home on the big screen downstairs on YouTube. Um, I think the challenge is finding it because there right. were certainly mm. some conversations around, well, where do I find it? How do I access it? And, and I think one of the things that I've certainly found and, and, and some of um, the, the rugby forums that I'm involved in, there's a lot of conversation around 
there's content there. It's just the easiest and best channel to access it and to find mm. it and, you know, that navigation piece. So, um, True. And, then, and yeah. I was also thinking about the fact that, you know, there are lots of old rugby games that I would love to watch again, like, you know, watching Johnny. Oh, kick, we all love the highlights. Kick is, you Absolutely. know, kick is, yeah. is blood is like winning, <laughs> winning um, conversion and, and some of those types of things that, that are in the archives mm. that we could potentially use to tell some of those stories that... that um, yeah, I'd Definitely. like some of them to go away, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Well, look, what a, yeah. what a fantastic conversation. I have really enjoyed this today. I, I would like to just sit down with you and chat for the rest of the evening. If we were in New York, we would be. Uh, but, look, are there any final comments for the future of rugby, the game we all love? Kate? Uh, I'm I'm supremely excited about the future of women's mm. rugby. I I think it's it's gaining momentum and uh, and some smart decisions will will continue to make it grow. And certainly mm. from my perspective as a as a coach at uni, you know I played for the club. I came back to give back to the sport. And I think there are also ways to, for us to be able to leverage some of those other individuals who, who are passionate about the game and, and get them a little bit more involved in, in some of the activities that we do. So um, so I just wanted to say thank you for, for having me today. Oh, look, well done for all you're doing for the game and the women's game. Fantastic. And Stephen, final comments? Not too much, I don't think. I, I think the, uh, the only thing I would mention is that in all, in all of this conversation, as far as rugby in Australia goes, the, the Wallabies being successful is still a big ticket item in the driver of rugby at all levels in, in, of the game and we should never take our eyes off that. Yeah, and look, I, and um, I guess for the, the last minute, and look, I agree with Maureen, Kate, I'm, I'm incredibly positive about the game. Mm. So, um, for those of you in New York who have got a very different perspective and we hopefully haven't <laughs> bored you too far into your wines and beers, um, <laughs> thank you for coming. I know a lot of the people in the room uh, had the... Uh, stream the game the other day, the uni game the other day, and um, and so I'm sure they see the positivity mm. of the lot alive and well as well. And, um, look, I do think that um, rugby's got a great opportunity uh, to absolutely leverage all the great things and mm. still compete locally where it has to, be it the US, be it here, wherever else. And um, thanks very much for having us all. Yes, and I'd, I'd echo that. Look, thanks, everyone, and thank you for your time today, our fantastic panellists. Uh, it's such a pleasure to get to engage with you in, the, in a deeper kind of sandpit discussion around, around rugby. It's, it's much needed, uh, but I think it, the future is optimistic. I think that's the conclusion we've come to. There's a lot of opportunity, uh, lower barriers to, to cut through now, I, I would say, in many instances, and lots of growth assets for the longevity of the game. So very exciting. And, Stephen, I'm with you. Our Wallabies can turn it around and um, you know, hopefully win this on weekend. Saturday. <laughs> and everyone in New York, I uh, hope you're having a, a really enjoyable evening and continue to enjoy that evening. We're really sorry we can't join you, uh, but we thank you very much for your time.